Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate it very much. It's uh, really an honor and a privilege to be here. So what am I doing in blues? Well, I wanted to kind of look like most of the people here, but also I wanted to, you know, it's kind of a prop. So I wanted to make sure everybody understood that we're here to uh, get business done here. And, uh, and if you don't mind, as we get through the t period, we've got to roll up our sleeves. Now, <laughs> if I were wearing whites, and I started taking my shirt off, and I'm standing up here in a t-shirt, <laughs> you'd say, well, what is that all about? And it may not go well, and my public affairs officer would really be freaking out <laughs> if that. Uh, I am, uh, I'm really excited about this. We have got to get down to, to basics, if you will, and brass tacks on talking about strategy. Uh, as Jamie said, you know, I'm a submariner, a nuke, and, and I have a lot of budget background, so I figured, well, we ought to be able to figure this out. Is it in a book somewhere? Is it laid out? What's the definition? And if not, well, let's buy it then. I'm, I'm sure we can buy strategy, you know? We'll have somebody just write it up for us. Neither one is gonna work. We have, we have got to sit, buckle down and do this. So sometime in the, the winter, uh, and I give props out to Robbie Harris and Dick Diamond, Robbie and Dick, who I sat out in the lobby, and Peter Schwartz, who run a, a strategy discussion group. And uh, the, so many of you are there. And so I, they invite me to come and talk about, so what's your kind of vision or how do you see the next year going? And I go up to do that and we eat pizza and it's on a Thursday night. And I said, this is kind of like the Christians, you know, getting together in the catacombs, you know, on a Thursday night, kind of huddled in here. And I said, if there's an opportunity to get this out, get the discussion of strategy out, then I read stuff that says the Navy doesn't have anybody that understands strategy. Where's the next fill in the blank? And I go, well, wait a minute. We're getting through things all right. And uh, then the current strategy forum idea came up and I said, that does it. I'm hijacking this damn thing if I can. And I asked the secretary if that was okay. And he said, yeah. I said, we're going to come up to Newport. We're going to talk about strategy. I want as many people, different kinds of folks, and they got to be uh, young. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, and we got to talk about strategy. And this is just the beginning. So, of course, the weather is gorgeous. And it's up in June. So everybody came. It's great to have you here. And everything's good the first time. But are you going to come in February in the next meeting? Are you coming in February? I guarantee the hotels will be cheaper. <laughs> but but uh, so I'm, I'm taken to, back to kind of a story. Um, and many of you have heard this, so I'm sorry. So bear with me. So uh, two guys are out hunting, all right? And the guy's got his hunting dog there. And this dog is pretty amazing. It's uh, scaring up, you know, it's get, got the birds up in the air. But it's not all that efficient, but it is gregarious. It, is, it runs hard. It's loyal. It's pretty smart, actually. But it's running all the place. And he said, it's an amazing dog. What's the name of that dog? And he goes, Commander. And he goes, really an amazing dog. You got to promote that dog. So they get together next year. And the dog, same dog, and he says, how's the dog? And he goes, great. He said, the dog's pretty efficient now, much smarter. It, it runs around and does things more efficiently, knows a lot of other dogs, networks very well. He says, what's the name of the dog? He says, I promoted it. It's Captain. And he goes, that's a good dog. So he said, you ought to think about promoting that dog again. So they get together the next year, and he said, hey, man, are you ready to go do some hunting? And he goes, ain't going to work out. He goes, what happened? He said, well, I promoted the dog to Admiral, and all it does is sit on the porch and bark at the other dogs. <laughs> all right? So there's a lesson here, ladies and gentlemen. If we're going to get strategy done, it ain't going to get done by the admirals, because all we're going to do is bark at each other and, may, and say, you ought to do it, and you ought to do it, and you ought to do it. It's these other folks out here in the room, some of who Jamie stood up, that I want to get embedded. And it's also those of you who have shown great interest. As I mentioned, the strategy discussion group. We got the War College Foundation, your mere presence here and your interest. We got the Naval Institute, Institute here, excuse me. We've got bloggers, we've got the Navy League here supporting it, and graybeards galore. And we got wardrooms. And I, I encourage all of you, I want to thank you all for coming here very much. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. So we got, we got to get down. First of all, Ted, thank you for allowing us to hijack and, and for being our host. Uh, as you may know, Ted Carter is, uh, we're sending him, we're going to promote, he's doing a lousy job, so we're going to promote him and send him up 
to the upper office. He's going to the Naval Academy to be our superintendent. And uh, this is going to be a wonderful job for you uh, as he moves on. So good for you. Now, Jamie uh, Fogo is, he's the guy that is kind of masterminding this thing. If you like the, the way the thing came together, Jamie uh, got together with Michelle Howard, and I think she gave him some leeway and sort of put that together. So uh, you got to get with Jamie if you like what you see or you want to get some changes. This was the place to have it. I want to I acknowledge some folks who I have deep respect for who are here today, Ambassadors Middendorf, uh, and Peters, thank you all very much for your service through the years, especially you, Ambassador Middendorf. Uh, so many times uh, here and there, you've given back uh, to your Navy uh, in song, in service, and of course to your country. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Admiral Hogg is here. Uh, two generations, two full generations, and I consider a generation about 10 years of leaders. So if you don't like what you see out here, Admiral Hogg, you know, go look in the mirror, okay? Because <laughs> although you didn't get me, I got through before you came, and I know you regret that, but things happen. <laughs> but I want to thank you so much. Two generations of leaders who, uh, as director of the Strategic Studies Group, not to mention a fantastic career. And a, a man I have deep, deep respect for, who is really, to me, a hero, and that's uh, Admiral Hilarino Barrera, who is working up here today, uh, chief of the Colombian Navy. If you want to read about a strategy gone right, and done proper, there's a book, No Lost Cause, uh, and it is the story of the transformation of the country, Colombia. And this man here was a part of that, working with his president. No Lost Cause, I guarantee you'll like that book. It's a book on strategy. So we're here, as Jamie alluded to, and as Ted said, at, and this is the intellectual capital of the Navy. That's the proper noun, but this is also where we have intellectual capital, if you will, the common noun up here. Our boot camp is kind of the, the Naval Academy and NROTC uh, for our officers. And we got kind of a C school at the Naval Postgraduate School at thinking about strategy and strategic issues. We have of equal significance here today, scholars, historians, students, and practitioners. It's where fleet experience meets academic theory. How about that? And uh, you know, my staff says, well, that's like iron sharpening iron. And I go, yeah, if it works well, it does. Otherwise, it's friction, heat, and sparks. <laughs> huh? And you don't know what you got. But done correctly, as you all know, uh, we can do this right. So this current strategy forum is for thought and opinion. And opinions, my view, are very much welcome. I would rather, I want you to come up, and, and we're going to have more of these kinds of sessions. And you've got to engage. Uh, I'd prefer that, that we do that. I don't mind reading about it. But when you read about it, first of all, you've got to have to you have to have time to read and you have to get the right one. And I love writing, but I also, as we develop our strategies, would love to have you uh, come in here. We got speakers who are strategists, scholars, and leaders, and everyone is a contributor. If you are silent, then in my view, you consent, and you, that's acquiescence. And uh, so we've chosen the invitation list very carefully. We'd love to have had more, and we'll build from this. And remember, this is the first iteration. So my goals today are to use this strategy forum to initiate a series of discussions. We gotta hang together, or we're gonna hang separately as we look out into what is a very, very difficult and challenging future. It, it's just kind of getting started. And we're gonna have to compromise, those of us that have deep embedded thoughts, and we're gonna have to coexist. And I'm talking about, again, the academics, the historians, and the fleet who have to go out and get this thing done. All aspects and all theories are welcome here at this, at this session, this series of, of sessions. And I'd like to engender a comfort level where uh, the, the Naval War College, if you will, and academics, like I said, DC and the fleet can all coexist. We have to do it. The eligibility for, for being part of this and for contributing, you have to be active duty or reserve, retired, a civilian, a contractor, or somebody in academia, so you're all here. I mean, it's, it's, uh, if I haven't said it enough, I'll continue to say it, we really need all of your input. So I'll start a dialogue, that's my job here, and set some foundation. I'll give some remarks, be happy to take questions and answers, and then we've got a great speaker uh, following me. So let me talk a little bit about the environment we face, the importance, on my view, of strategy, uh, and a way ahead, I think, uh, as we move along in there. 
Challenges. What's it like out there today? The environment we face is pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, you know, a CNO, as I look back, having worked for a few, one very close uh, as the vice CNO, and uh, watch things from out in Asia where I served, the CNOs get out and about in the different theaters at, at different periodicities. And in the past, if you, you know, it's kind of written, if you get to a theater once a year for a good, really good visit, that's pretty good. So you multiply that around the different theaters, and you're out there maybe five times a year. So for what it's worth, uh, I've been to the Asia Pacific three times in the last four months, six times in the last 13 months. Been to Europe four times in the last three months to different areas. In the Mideast, two times in six months. And my point is, well, what's that? Uh, you, it's a balance of budget the, the, in Washington, D.C., and what we got to do out in the world today. And what I'm telling you is, uh, in my view, i got to engage a lot more. And I've, I'm spending less time. I have to delegate more to the important issues of budget back there. And i got to get out and get overseas, and it's about partnerships. And there's a lot of that because this is a complex and dynamic world. And ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake, everywhere I go on all of those trips, people look to us to lead and carry this world of ours, the free world, through the complexities that we have, symmetric and asymmetric. We got competitors that are traditional and they're new and they're in every single domain. As I speak today, we've got two pretty big undersea challenges. We're doing fine, but we haven't had these challenges in quite some time. Cyber is, it's like a warm war, you know? Uh, you get onto the Fort Meade, you can get into the certain buildings and every time I go in there, I'm inspired and I'm worried. Uh, about the things going on. Cyber is going on day in and day out, and we are being challenged. A lot of destabilizing forces for both the economy and for the peace. And it's, it's human originated, but it's also Mother Nature. You all are well aware of the climate challenges we have today. I was in the Arctic in uh, March up there in a thing called ISEX, where we take, we've done this for decades. We take two submarines, we go up, we exercise, and ensure we know what we're doing up there in the Arctic. It's run by the Arctic Submarine Lab. Very good thing. Up there about 200 miles north of Dead Horse, Alaska, which is about a third of the way between Canada and west uh, and uh, Alaska, all the way north up in the Arctic Ocean. It's not at the North Pole, which some people think. So what is my point? Really an elaborate, well-run ice camp. And I said, we gotta, they do it every three years. We've got to do this at least every other year. We have got to go up and figure out what's going on up there. And we're going to do that at least every other year. We may be going annually up there to figure out what is going on up there because it's an issue. We have, uh, obviously, a wide array of issues, state-driven, counterinsurgency, transnational, North Korea, Iran, Iraq, I wouldn't have been implanted at until just recently, Pakistan, East China Sea, South China Sea, narco-terrorism, it's still running down south in the Caribbean and all around there. That's still going on and we're still down there. Tribal issues. Europe is back on the table security-wise. It is back on the landscape. We were there last week, the chiefs of the UK, chiefs of the of, uh, US, uh, we sat down with our respective chairmen and talked about the different things we got to do. My message out there uh, to my counterparts was, uh, we need you back. We need you back. Uh, back where you were before. That asymmetric capability that, that uh, UK partners bring, especially the Royal Navy, we got to get out there. The Queen Elizabeth will have a ceremony, a naming ceremony, we would kind of call it christening ceremony here next month. They are building astute submarines. These are high end, and we need them back, and we talked about that. The Arab Spring is still evolving. You all know about that. So what does that mean for our Navy, for your Navy out in the future? In my view, I believe the nation We'll need the Navy to be present where it matters, when it matters. And uh, I kind of grab that phrase. I say it over and over and over again. But a few days ago, fortunately, we had a carrier strike group where it mattered, when it mattered. And in a matter of a few days, you know, hours to days, we're where we need to be. So we're ready to go, just like we were ready to go in Syria, just like we were ready to go in the Red Sea, just like we were ready to go only a little over a year ago when North Korea, Kim Jong-un said, I think I'll launch a ballistic missile. And we said, okay, we'll shoot it down if we need to, because we can do that, because we can be where it matters, when it matters. Presence will remain our mandate, ladies and gentlemen. I firmly believe that. We will, we're just as comfortable being the supported commander for undersea warfare. That's our gig. Ballistic missile defense afloat. That's our gig. Or if we're supporting things such as strike, close air support in Afghanistan, uh-huh, still going on. 
We're still doing that. And expeditionary warfare with our partners in the Marine Corps. Our compass for these decisions, for these long-range decisions, to be able to do that is a strategy, a good strategy, a strategy that suits the evolving conditions that we have in this really, really complex world. So uh, let me share with you my concept and what I believe the importance of, of a Navy strategy is. I don't have this nailed down. These are my thoughts and observations. I need help. We need your help. We need your thoughts, like I said before. Now to some, the concept of strategy is pretty simple, but uh, I struggle with it sometimes. And what I struggle with is, what am I telling my commanding officers and our leaders out there we really need to do in this strategy? If they read it and they say, what, what do these words mean? You know, what is this word that we've invented inside the Pentagon, perhaps, or in the Beltway? Because uh, that's not my vocabulary, or it means something different. We have to work on that. My strategy has to be sensible to a commanding officer, and a chief petty officer has to be able to read it. It says, Billy, Susie, come on over here. We're going to talk to you about this. And they have to be able to talk about it. Because if we can't do that, we're not communicating. So I struggled, I struggled with the defense strategic guidance to a point before we could take that and break that thing down. And that's a pretty well-written document in my view. So how it translates to commanders and leaders, and oh, by the way, our allies. You know, I spent a lot of time over this last period. They say, so what does this mean? I go, well, it's like this. So that takes a lot of beer, sake, wine, and tea to, to sit down and, and walk this stuff through. And we can do better, and we have to. I need your help at, at doing that. Strategy is overused sometimes. Uh, it, it's used and they say, well, you mean your plan, your vision, your objective, or just your tactics? What is it? Is your calling it a strategy? So it's different things to people. And uh, sometimes the document is nothing more than, well, we got ends, ways, and means. So we got a strategy. And you go, the ends to what? What are those ends and, and what are you going to do with them? So where do you go from there? If it's what we try to do sometimes in the Pentagon, we say, well, let's take this strategy and we'll run it down through an O plan or a defense planning strategy and we'll be able to precisely do something. And that's very good, except it's probably, no, it is precisely wrong. So what have we accomplished by doing that? And an O plan might be simply what people call the strategy in phase zero. What's your strategy? Well, we're doing this, which ends up being the phase zero of the O plan. You say, well, is that really a strategy? I don't know the answer to that but I'd like to ring this stuff out because I think, if, uh, I think we're confusing our kids because I'm having a heck of a time getting through it. We can do better, and I know we will when we put our, put our minds to it. In Washington, in the world that I live, the budget drives the strategy, and that's not all that bad <clears throat> because money that they give you is our reality and, and what we can do. We buy and employ a Navy that we can afford. Others say that a strategy... Is a, is a narrative. It tells you who we are, and it's a message inward and a message outward. And it tells the story, and that kind of agrees with me. It kind of agrees with me if we can do that. Now, at this current strategy forum, as I said before, we got scholars, and it'll help us think about it. I just met Sir Lawrence Friedman, and he's done a nice job. He's, he's written a pamphlet, uh, for those of you, uh, on strategy. And uh, it's, a, it's actually... I don't usually stand around here and, and put, you know, endorse books, but I, I started reading a lot of, a lot of this book, and um, it deals in strategy in a whole host of ways. If you haven't read the, his book, I would commend it to you. But he actually discusses the, the Moses and uh, the Ten Commandments and, uh, and the Jews and their plight with the Egyptians. And I've got to tell you, as a Roman Catholic, I've read Exodus a few times, and I've seen Cecil B. DeMille's movie with Charlton Heston, you know, and Yul Brenner, you know, so let it be written, so let it be, I wish I could do that, so let it be written, so let it be done. And the 10 plagues, I just never, I never had it right, but uh, you read this book, you will understand the 10 plagues, God's strategy with the Pharaoh, with Moses and the whole thing. And if you think I'm kidding, I'm not. He actually, Sir Lawrence Freeman goes through quite a bit. But it's called Strategy of History. It's good. There's more than one way to look at strategy is this point. How has history looked at strategies and good strategies? And strategy is sometimes thought of as the art of creating power, as Sir Lawrence Friedman mentions it in, in his book. The art of creating power, doing how to create 
the best that you can with what you have there. So for me, as we go forward, I think our strategy has to ground us, has to set our foundation, and it has to guide us. It'll help us anticipate the challenges. This is important too. invest accordingly to those challenges, focus our effort, be judicious with what we have. That's people, money, and time. That's what we give our commanders. We give them people. They have to use them judiciously, their time, and of course, the money that they have. And we have to articulate our being, what we're about to our allies and our partners and our adversaries as well. As I said before, I've been through this, hey, tell me about this QDR and this update you did with the DSG with my counterparts in the UK, Japan, France, Canada, Republic of Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia just this year, where that was an agenda item from them. It's very important to our allies. They follow us very closely on what we're going to do with our strategy. So it's got to be comprehensive. To me, there are compulsory aspects of our strategy, deterrence, strategic, nuclear, and conventional. Sea control, that one needs a little refinement. What is maritime superiority? What do we need for undersea dominance and to own that domain? Power projection, that's clearly a core part of what we do, both at sea, land, and space. Maritime security, that's where our allies and our partners come together. And all domain access, to get where we need to get in every domain, the cyber domain, the undersea, surface air, when we need to do it, and as long as we need to do it. And that's a lot about what air sea battle is about. So what do I want done? As I look forward and what I tell Jamie Fogo and what I'm asking all you all to think about as we go forward. We need to approach this thing as a continuum. For starters, the strategy itself, a framework for action. Um, it's not necessarily an endpoint, and that's what Mr. Friedman says in his book also. But a lot will say, well, that strategy has to define an input. So tell me, fill in the blank, testifying or whatever, what can this thing do? Well, there's a host of things it can do. No, no, what does it do? Well, that would be, again, precisely wrong. And I don't, I don't buy that. The chairman doesn't buy that. As we thought through the QDR and others, you can't do that. I just don't think that'll work, and it's, it's not going to be helpful. But what we, do, what we do need is we need process, we need people, and we need a system for our strategy. We need a process to draft, to implement, and to evolve it. I don't want to write it, put it up here, and say, well, that's that. We'll see how that goes until somebody else comes along some number of years and says, this thing's kind of old and dusty, or it's sitting on the coffee table. We need people, people like you and those that, as apostles, you will go out and get that are confident in their thought and understanding strategy, have a diversity of thought and are willing to grasp this and take it on. And we need a system to produce and to nurture strategic thinkers. So here's what I want to do. One, we've got to refresh the current strategy. And that's in progress. That's part of the process. We'll take a look at it. I'll ask you to take a look at it. Uh, Jamie and the group under Michelle Howard, we've put together uh, a pretty good kind of framework, if you will, for uh, doing that. I need it scrubbed by not just the academics. I need the junior officers to look at it, the mid-grade officers and the senior officers. I need all hands on deck to take a look at CS21 refresh and see if it makes sense. And by the way, this is a C service in the end, signed by the Commandant, the Commandant, and the CNO, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, and the Navy. So Fogo, will, he'll, he'll give you those in the next two days. Number two, we need to clarify the Navy strategic enterprise. That's the system part of this. Organizations and staffs that will develop, communicate, and assess our strategy. So we're taking a look at it in a systematic way, not periodically, not out here just out there in the blogosphere or when people get together. I want to be more organized in that approach. Put the talents and the energies in this in a focused manner and make sure that the strategy that we have is able to be connected. Three, I want to reestablish a relationship between the strategy and the budget process. Good luck with that, right? No, I think we can do that because when, I ask, when my staff brings me the proposed budget, they say, well, here's the shipbuilding plan, the aviation plan, here's how many of this is and that's and weapons, and I go, well, what can it do? 
what can it do? So I said, well, number one, number one, do we have strategic deterrence? Is that fully funded? And how do I know? And what do I get? Et cetera, et cetera. So the strategy should be a means of a lens or a filter that we run our budget through to make sure that what we are putting together, we haven't gone outside the strategy and where we want to go. And it makes sense that what we've put together will get what we think it'll get, get us where we think we need to go. So I want to get that connection put back together. Uh, you see a lot in the budget process, you see something printed, oh, it's really popular down in Washington, winners and losers. And here's, you know, here's how many of these things you bought and how many of those you say, but what does all of that mean? And what does that get us? So we need to establish that relationship. Number four, we need to nurture a Navy strategic cadre. That's people. So we need to educate them, build the confidence of the future forces. The graduate programs, master's programs at the postgraduate school and at the war colleges. And Ted, I commend you for what you've done up here in the pilot program, the Navy Strategic Specialty Master's Program. That's a good start. Let's take it from there and move out. We need to position strategic subspecialists carefully. Keep them in the mainstream, make sure they're moving on, and track the maritime strategists and assign them so you're going to get some sort of return on investment. Don't plug them in out there and they produce nice things, but they just sit there. Put them where they best utilize. And then lastly, number five, we need strategic mentorship. Officers and civilians who are interested in strategy, given strategists and our young people a hug and talk to them about the strategy because we need your help. We need Peter Schwartz's and Robbie Harris's, Dick Diamond's, et cetera, and all you guys out there to continue to do that and nurture and bring somebody around. I'm a, I mean, I'm a recovering budget officer and Dave Rosenberg a long time ago put his arm around me and said, come on to this meeting on Thursday night I said, I don't have time on Thursday night. That's when Cheers is on. And I, I don't have time for that. You know, Frazier. And he said, no, you're going to have to defer the TV. So uh, I went to that and learned so much more. We need to continue to nurture to do that. So let's work to reinvigorate the strategic mindset. We got the talent. We got the energy. We got ideas. They're all out there, and they're all out there around the fleet. We need to focus, nurture, and align to the future. I want to thank you all for coming to this forum very much. But I need you to listen. I need you to learn. I need you to speak up. And I need you to engage. And for those of you out there in the whites with the shoulder boards, I need you to meet. I need you to write. And I want you to publish your ideas. You are the future. You will decide where we're going to go. We'll try to align it and build a framework for it. But, but you're that future. So for all of you, I look forward to your feedback. I thank you very much for listening. I'm ready to take some questions. So, you know, thank you very much. Well, people are thinking, let me kick off with the first question of the day, if I may, sir. Uh, your travel schedule has been incredible while you hold down things in Washington. You were out in Qingdao in China. You mm -hmm. signed the Q's agreement for the code for unplanned encounters and seas. Uh, you've been in Pakistan, Norway. Korea, Japan, while you were in Japan, the Prime Minister publicly spoke about collective self-defense. And then you were in France and the UK, 70th anniversary of one of the greatest allied operations of all times. So the question is about partnerships. You mentioned it. Why is it so important, sir, for our future strategy? Well, uh, first of all, our people, the, the world, the free world, they do turn to this country. I mean, I, I read about it and I mentioned it before and I see it all the time. We can't do it alone. There's no way. We need, and Jamie and I wrote an article about it. Some of you may have seen it in proceedings. In my view, we need to continue to pursue a global network of, of navies out there to get done what needs to get done. You just sweep your hand across. You, you start on a chartlet, and you look over to the left of uh, Gibraltar, wherever you want to start, and you go all the way across to New England, and you look at the stuff going on out there in the world and the maritime challenges. We need to pull this together. At any given day, around there in the world, there's about 700 ships uh, underway in the free world, if you will. Uh, so I don't count China or Russia or some of the other navies um, that are underway doing a coalition activity. Some of it is very organized uh, by, through piracy and counterterrorism and, and smuggling and some of that. Some of it's not quite. Uh, some of it's episodic, uh, such as prevention of chemical weapons. And the point is, 
we need to nurture and bring together those partnerships in the, and, and start with the most common foundation and continue to build it up. I think they are ready to do that. Uh, I have the, the privilege of going to various fora where I meet with heads of Navy, you know, their international symposia, a sea power symposium, and the capstone event is in this institution, and we're gonna do it in September. And we're gonna take something like QIS, um, and we're gonna, we're gonna develop that further. We've all, we collectively, and that's all of us, uh, chiefs have agreed that it is a, a viable subject that needs, needs to go beyond the Western Pacific around the world, where we start with simple things like common behavior, common networks, a standard organization for dealing with a NEO, a non-combatant uh, evacuation order. And you know who brought that up? The Chinese chief. He said, we got to figure out how to do a NEO together, all of us. He goes, I tried to get my people out of Libya. It was a disaster. That place was all messed up. We had ships from all over the place. I was lucky I didn't have a collision trying to get that out, trying to get things out of Tripoli Harbor. I said, okay, good, good, Abel, will you lead the seminar? He said, well, I will. And, and, it, and it goes on like that. People who understand uh, maritime counterterrorism and things of that nature. As I mentioned, uh, Abel uh, Barrera and, and the folks down in the, uh, in the South American navies know very much about counter-drug and counterterrorism and can help us a lot. So it, it's our future uh, partnerships. We have got to buckle down and figure out how to bring it together. Now, there, it's gonna be fits and starts because we have different political agenda, uh, but we gotta find the common denominator, and there are a few out there, and just keep working it and grinding our way through it. We've had ups and downs with, with ourselves in the Chinese Navy. It was not all that easy getting that final signature on QS, but you know who brought it home? The Chief of the Malaysian Navy. He said, we have gotta get this done. He put the pressure on the entire ASEAN group and said, we have got to bring this thing home. He reached over and, and his Indonesian chief partner said, yep, I completely agree with you. And, and that kind of outside work in partnerships rather than just you know, the standard guys kind of pulling, our countries pulling it together uh, is what'll make this work. Yes, please. Admiral, um, I found that to be uh, inspiring actually and it's, uh, it's, it's always great to hear what the armed services are thinking in terms of our future. Now, when I think about grand strategy, two things come to mind. Uh, one is culture, and historically, if you look at organizations, Apple once had actually a second-rate culture, and they became a first-rate culture, and all their operational plans worked because they flowed from a great culture. General Motors once had an unbelievable culture and 60% of the world's auto market share. But their culture didn't keep contemporary, and in fact, they victimized themselves. And all of these operational problems you see today are the result of a broken culture. So I, I think, one, who is the guardian of the culture, and is there some thinking going on to make the culture vibrant and contemporary and more like Apple's evolution than General Motors' evolution? And the second thing is, because you've woven budgetary things throughout your talk, um, a lot of people wonder, with America having the amount of defense spending equal to the rest of the world combined, and yet we can see that the services are starved for money in certain areas, how did that happen and is there any solution? Well, first of all... Small question, sorry. Yeah, uh, that's okay. Uh, first of all, I'm responsible for the culture because I'm the chief of the naval operations. Two, to be, on the topic at hand, I would like, this is the intellectual capital for strategic thought. So things come up to here. You know, this is like the Lord of the Rings, the, although that was a negative connotation, but uh, where, where we start, you know, the, where we bring together and have, have the, that, that discussion for uh, thought. So we have got to invigorate that culture out of here. But it has to, to move out there. Now, I will use my, my director for strategy and operations, so my N35, will advise me on that working with the president of the Naval War College. But anyway, I'm responsible. I will work with, or this will be the centerpiece, the location. And as I said before, 
they will partner with the Naval Academy. We will start chatting with our midshipmen, our ROTC people, the Naval Postgraduate School, in certain elements, you'll get into like sea school, right? Where you'll get to, if it's cyber, if it's acoustics, you'll get into the details of that. Uh, the, the idea of cost, I find it interesting because the cost of a ship in our Navy, in our country, because of what it costs, is not the same as the cost of a ship in another country. I mean, it just, the labor rates are different, the material rates are different, uh, what the, the um, quality is very different, and the classification of this room precludes you from getting into it, but I find we build pretty good, tough ships, others don't, okay? They're not as tough as our ships. We can argue in individual classes. But when you, when you get to that, the, the gross cost, it just doesn't do it for me. I, I, I've gone through this a couple of times, and uh, it just doesn't, it's not an apples to apples comparison. But the other piece is, you know, the global, uh, excuse me, the, the gross domestic product, you know, what people will invest in their, in their uh, armed forces. Okay, I got that. I'd say the capability. What is the capability that somebody is building toward? In other words, if somebody is building a bunch of stuff, very cool. Does any of that stuff work together? Will it hold together? Is it durable? Uh, can it be changed over time? And do you have the people to man that thing so they know how to use it? Those are a lot of questions that some folks, again, I'll keep out of the individual uh, specifics of it. So um, we have got challenges. We've got to evolve into the future in some areas. We can't spend the way we're spending in some regards, if you will, because we'll just run out. Uh, and we have to look at payloads more than platforms. That's kind of a general panoply of things. Thank you. Yes, sir, over here on the left. Yeah. Not only regional power, but growing economically throughout the world. Sir, I detect in, uh, in uh, military journals and sometimes on television uh, a reluctance to discuss operations, tactics, and strategy on how we would deal with the very, very potent uh, Chinese Air Force and Navy in the maritime uh, realm. So how do we square that circle where we can discuss with our mid-level officers and our chiefs and our, uh, our systems operators how we would fight a very capable If you talk about it openly, you cross the line and you unnecessarily antagonize <laughs> diplomatically. <laughs> you do. It's, it, no, seriously, I mean, uh, just, just give us some thought. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to try and preach to you, but give us some thought. You, you probably have a sense for how much we trade with that country, right? All right it's astounding, the two. So if you think about why would we don't want to antagonize it, but we look, as I said, our... Uh, who's to say what the problems will be in the future? And I'm, I'm you know, I thought, okay, look, Europe, come on, guys, it's okay. Well, that's back on the landscape. You know, remember, Russia, come on, and say, oh, really? So, it, it, in a very, in a classified nature, we look at all of this. I know you've been exposed to some of them. There are groups up here that do this full time, and they, and they're talking strategies and all that. But people say, well, we need to talk about it more openly. Ref A, we, we can't do that. It's, it will antagonize it, and it will, uh, well, it will unnecessarily muddy waters. My view, people ask me, what are you going to do about the South China Sea? And he said, I say, we're going to manage it. That's what we're going to do. We're going to work on QAs. I got to get together. I'm leaving for July, you know, and everything holds together to, to visit my counterpart, uh, Emil Wu. He's invited me and my wife to China. My wife and I, to China, whatever, over to, that's why I'm a budget officer, <laughs> to, to China. My point is, we got to manage through this, kiddo. Uh, and that's our job, to manage through it, no miscalculation, clarity of where we're coming from, freedom of the sea. They, they understand that. I don't like it, but they understand that, and we got to figure out how to do that. Uh, somebody stand up and talk. You got too many hands up. Where's my moderator? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, Lieutenant Cavero from Officer Training Command. And to that uh, approach that you're suggesting that we manage the South China Sea problem, doesn't it appear then from a Chinese perspective that it's the second coming of the Boxer War? 
that the great Western evil empire is coming back to uh, contain and prevent the return of what is a historically righteous place in the world for them. Yep. It appears that it will destabilize uh, the region if we take an active role in managing what is to them a local problem. Yeah, well, we never left. I, I mean, I, I, forgive me, but we, we've had 50 ships in the Western Pacific. Today we have like 51. We've had 50 ships, plus or minus two or three, for a decade, uh, sailing the South China Sea, down to Singapore and all that. We're definitely talking a lot more about it. We're exercising more. That is the, re the rebalance to the Asia Pacific. So that'd be one point I'd make. And I talk to, when Admiral Wu and I talk, I say, well, look, how often have we been in and out of Hong Kong? You know, and Shanghai, and they invite us, and Jingdao. But, but yes, we are now talking very openly about, hey, you guys, you're being very aggressive out here. You're pushing things. In some cases, your, your, your commanding officers are, are violating the rules of the road. We need a deliberate way to manage our way through this, or we're going to have collisions, and, and we're going to turn it over to how, um, let's see, what are you, department head? No, sir, I'm a curriculum developer at Officer Training Command. Whatever. You, take you. <laughs> Take you in 10 years and you're out there, right, with 350 people or 200 people on your destroyer. And I say, okay, good luck. And you say, well, you got any guidelines? I say, don't screw it up. What the? So, and then, and then your counterpart's over there too. So we say, I'll tell you what, let's, let's speak English. Everybody was good with that. Let's, here's how we're going to address so that you know what you're going to get from that other fellow or gal, whichever how it works. And, and then you know how you're going to start your conversations and, and how you will uh, maintain distance, you get my point. And the same has to, to work in aviation. Now, that's a good start, so we don't have a miscalculation. I, I get your point that people would submit, okay, you guys are coming over there. We, look, we never left maritime, okay? Well, they're not gonna be happy here, but okay. <laughs> ma'am, uh, two more. Uh, sir, and then ma'am, you next. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, the Arctic Ocean. Uh, is your, I'm a Canadian, and I'm just wondering uh, your standpoint on, I think we've had a bit of a, a disagreement on some of the law of the sea issues up there, but we're trying to extend now the, the continental shelves for the various countries. How do you see your foray there in a long-term strategy? Certainly it's a, a, a serious issue with the Canadian government and uh, the Arctic Ocean is, is our third ocean, but really has not been pushed to any great extent uh, from our country. So I'm just wondering your viewpoint of where you're going up in that region. Well, I've asked uh, my staff, number one, get with industry and find out what is their intent in the, well, no, I'm sorry. No, step one, when is the ice melting? When is it truly passable for non ice-hardened hulls so that, you know, regular ships can compact, because it's just not, uh, it's not economically feasible if you don't have, okay, one. So understand the traffic and what year, one. Two, okay, so th if this is the intended traffic, what routes will they take, okay? Three, is, is there any threat up there, or is it sort of like the South Atlantic or other parts where there's just no threat? Okay, four, uh, other territorial disputes. Now we're starting to get into, you know, as you kind of alluded to, uh, the Northwest Passage, a lot of them say uh, kind of shallow, don't see it as a lot of traffic uh, in that regard. And then, then what are the means that we will engage? One, we need to stay active in the various fora that are up there, uh, the Arctic Council and others. Two, we've got to work definitely close with you guys say, so what say you? Three, well, we're doing, uh, there's um, too many numbers up here. We gotta get together with the Coast Guard. They are responsible for security. We're responsible for defense. We will support them if there's a crisis up there, you know, a big accident or something. So we gotta be ready to respond. So uh, when, what is the threat? Uh, what are the disputes? Clarify them in English so we can understand them and then go to work w with you all. Meanwhile, build systems that are Arctic compatible uh, and work toward how do we work up there getting the exercising part with, with partners. So it sounds great. I got to take that down to an actionable process. 
Ma'am, uh, here. Thank you. CNO Jill Ballard, OpNav N9. And in reconciling um, strategy and budget uh, and planning for our future fleet, um, I find a struggle with the, the presence argument in that, that it drives so much cap capacity. You know, you mentioned all the demands around the globe um, and capability requirements and how best to plan for, you know, 30 years from now for the assets that we're building now, how do you, um, you know, do you have any recommendations on yeah. what kind of word? Well, I used the term, I, when I started the watch, I used uh, six words because, well, that's a limit of my capacity to say it over and over again. And I said, war fighting is first. You've got to think of war, and it's how you think about things. How does that affect war fighting? War fighting first. Second, operate forward, and then third is be ready. The operate forward, I think some folks think, I want everybody to leave port and operate forward. That's not what it means. It means as much as feasible, position forward. And, and that includes forward deployed naval force. The Ross just showed up in uh, Rota yesterday. So now we have two destroyers, Aegis destroyers, front line in Rota, Spain. That's a change recently. We will be putting two destroyers, two more Aegis destroyers in Japan, forward deployed naval force. That means sailors, ships, and families. The uh, Singapore government has invited us to put four little combat ships by 17, uh, and that's forward station in Singapore. So we'll rotate those crews, but the ships will be forward for a period of time. We are developing ships called joint high-speed vessels. Those ships will go forward, we'll rotate the crews. Similar with a, a ship, you get my point, different classes of ships to put them forward. Then, Jill, we've got to reconcile what can we support in rotational deployment. Ah, that's the key. At, at the rate we're going now, it's kind of unsustainable uh, that we have this great global force management lay down out there, and then we get, and then we step it up some periodically here and there, uh, and we pull somebody who should be getting ready for rotational deployment, and we move them over there because we can or because somebody gives us gas money. So what I'm saying, Jill, is we're not all gonna run for it, but we must reconcile in our strategy what the presence level is that we feel we need, okay, that, or the capability, and then we'll, we'll adjust the capacity of that based on the budget and the desire of the nation to be forward. But I believe we need to reconcile that forward part first, that present part, because that's what we do. Okay, thanks.